Welcome to Enviro Close-Up. I'm Carl Grossman. The subject, cancer and the environmental connection. With us is Sandra Steingraber. She's a biologist and she's also a cancer survivor. And Ellen Crowley. She is an activist and a cancer survivor too. And both are active in the Women's Community Cancer Project of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Sandra, the connection between cancer and the environment. Well, for me, there's, it's a very personal one as well as a professional one. I was diagnosed with cancer as a, as a young woman. Um, at the age of 20, I was diagnosed with bladder cancer. And that began, for me, an investigation into what I call my ecological roots, which, uh, like genealogical roots, uh, are a way of understanding our biological heritage. And what I was specifically interested in learning is what kinds of contaminants existed in the community and the environment where I grew up and uh, I was able to take advantage of some of the new right to know laws which make that information public information, which is a journey I uh, encourage everyone to, to undertake. It was a very meaningful one uh, for me. Um, professionally, I'm an ecologist, so I'm used to thinking of um, indirect effects in the environment, how tiny changes over here can elicit mighty effects somewhere else in the system. and the connections between cancer and the environment appear in, in a profound way from that perspective as well. Let's talk about your story, Ellen. You too are a cancer survivor, and that's what uh, sparked your, uh, well, your research into all this. Mm -hmm. I'm a cancer survivor. I was diagnosed in 1988 with breast cancer. Um, a year before my sister at age 43 was diagnosed with breast cancer, I was 49. Uh, a year before that, my cousin at 43 was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, my mother and two aunts had breast cancer, and a number of my other aunts and uncles from my mother's family had other kinds of cancers. Um, I became an activist very early, but I really didn't make the environmental connection until as a social worker and a family therapist, I went to Ireland and checked my roots, and I found that the two of my mother's siblings who grew up in Ireland did not developed cancer and lived into the late 80s and early 90s and as did my mother's parents who grew up in Ireland and my mother, the two aunts that had breast cancer and the three who had other cancers all grew up in Lawrence, Mass, which was an early textile mill town. So I'm not a scientist but I began to become very interested in what was in the water in Lawrence or what was in the environment there. And I'm now interested in the genetic environmental connection. I'm in the process of being genetically tested because um, I think that it's, it's always a question. What starts things? So. One of the things that's interesting to me as a biologist hearing Ellen's story is that it's uh, typical of what we know about uh, immigrants and cancer in the environment. There's a whole body of study that have looked at immigrants who come from Japan and move to the United States, Africa and move to Israel, uh, England and moved to Australia and within a generation or two migrants uh, take on the cancer risk of their new country and and obviously whatever is in their diet and environment of that adopted homeland overrides uh, genetic and, and ethnic factors. So for example um, Af African Jewish women moving to Israel within a very short period of time acquire um, the breast cancer risk of their Israeli born sisters there, uh, and that's quite a high risk. Whereas a woman moving from Canada into a, or England into a lower risk country like uh, Australia, she'll actually lower her breast cancer risk through that kind of migration. And that's one of the reasons as ecologists we're very interested in looking at what might be in that new environment that could, could alter a woman's chance of getting cancer. Sandra, th there's been a kind of counterclaim to the well, the body of work which connects cancer and the environment, cancer and pollution actually, uh, to a large degree, a counterclaim that, no, 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 it's, it's not the environment. There's new research which suggests it's uh, oh, lifestyle or uh, oh, eating sour cream or, or, or something else. What do you think about this, uh, this counterattack? Well, I think what we've done is shift from a discussion about our exposure to disease-causing agents, namely carcinogens, into a discussion about individual behavior and personal habits. 
And uh, I think, unfortunately, in people's minds, people carry those uh, ideas around in two separate categories, when in fact our uh, particular lifestyles are embedded within a, uh, an environment. After all, the style in which we live our lives isn't uh, separate from the earth on, on which we live them. So let's take, for example, diet, which we like to think of as uh, a part of our lifestyle. Um, the food we eat, we have a particular cultural relationship to, we have certain food preferences. We, we define those by our socioeconomic class, by gender, et cetera, et cetera. But um, for me as an ecologist, our diet is our place in the food chain as well. So with 30% of cancers now officially attributed to uh, diet, what I'm interested in asking is what is it about our diet that places us at risk? It seems as though consumption of animal fat is a risk factor for several of the big ticket malignancies like colon cancer. But we also know that animal fat is more contaminated with carcinogens, things like pesticides, industrial solvents, dioxins, than other forms of food. So by eating high on the food chain and eating a high fat diet, which is a choice and a lifestyle factor, it also reflects where we're at in the food chain and it reflects the magnification of toxics in our environment to that place in the food chain. So the way, in my mind, diet is, uh, has one foot each in lifestyle and the environment. And I'm interested in understanding how aspects of the environment can modify and potentiate certain lifestyle risk. So they're really not independent categories that we can pull apart. Uh, this is one of the, the many pieces of literature put out by the Women's Community Cancer Project of Cambridge, Boston. Actually, a slash there, you have Cambridge and Boston together uh, in your organization's title. Uh, cancer and the Environment, Make the Link, it's titled. 25 years after Richard Nixon declared war on cancer, there has been an 18% increase in cancer incidence and 6% in mortality. Most of the efforts expended on the war on cancer have focused on detection, treatment, and the mechanism of cancer development. Meanwhile, our food, our water are contaminated. And you go on to explain how our air is contaminated very products meant to improve our lives, products such as Ajax Cleaner and Old English Lemon Furniture Polish and so forth are laden with carcinogens. And well, here's a, this is the bottom line. It has been estimated that without the environmental factors generally agreed to cause most cancers, the incidence of this disease could be reduced by 80 to 90 percent. Helen, what's not happening here? Well, I think what's not happening is we're not hearing from the mainstream press the reality of the situation. Uh, before we had discussed the fact that everyone knows someone with cancer. No one knows that one in three Americans are developing cancer. The most literate people, the people who are reading newspapers every day, are shocked to hear that. It's gradually becoming known. So first of all, we're not hearing the extent of the increases. Secondly, we're not hearing anything from the Main Street Press about, or we're hearing very little from them about what is being written to describe the environmental cancer link. Recently, some scientists took an ad out in the New York Times, and they said, why aren't you reviewing the books that are talking about these things? Um, there are books that are fascinating, frightening, but really worth reading that don't get reviewed or are reviewed negatively. Uh, there's an epidemic out there uh, of cancer, and you're pointing to uh, what appears to be the primary cause, environmental pollution. I think when people make the connection, maybe they can demand that the, uh, the, real, the real causes of cancer be dealt with and uh, mm -hmm. something done about the, uh, the epidemic. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you so much, Ellen. This has been Enviro Close-Up. I'm Carl Grossman. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.